Hello and welcome to this edition of FYI Weekly, your official source for City of Greensboro news and information. It has been nearly one month since Greensboro Police Chief John Thompson assumed his new leadership role. Thompson joined the Greensboro Police Department in 2003. Prior to that, his law enforcement career began in 1998 with the Asheboro Police Department. Thompson has served in various roles at GPD, including planning and research, vice narcotics, resource management, and bureau commander of the patrol division. Chief Thompson said it is truly an honor to be selected to lead such a nationally accredited agency with an exceptional team of dedicated officers and employees. I am prioritizing challenges such as violent crime and police community relations while proposing unique approaches to recruitment and retention through innovation and inclusivity. The community will play a vital role in achieving public safety for all Greensboro residents. Outside of the police department, Thompson is involved in several professional organizations such as the North Carolina Police Executives Association, Internal Association of Chiefs of Police, Police Executive Research Forum, and American Society of Evidence-Based Policing. Thompson holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Management and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Justice Policy Studies Administration from Guilford College and a Master's in Business Administration from Pfeiffer University. He is also a graduate of the Senior Management Institute for Police and the Southern Police Institute Administrative Officers Program at the University of Louisville. The City of Greensboro's Human Rights Commission will host the 37th Annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Breakfast on Monday, January 16th. The event will take place at the Cory Convention Center with the theme, Everyday Champions, Honoring Local Civil Rights Pioneers. The keynote speaker is Cone Health Chief Inclusion Officer Nikita Green. Other highlights include recognition of the inaugural class of the city's everyday champions of human rights. This year's breakfast is limited to 400 seats in an effort to prevent a super spreader situation. Individuals and groups can watch the program on the City of Greensboro's YouTube channel. Live coverage of the breakfast will start at 7.30 a.m. Names of event sponsors are displayed at the breakfast and recognized during the program. The Human Rights Commission is tasked with improving the quality of life for Greensboro residents by encouraging fair treatment and promoting mutual understanding and respect among all people. To sponsor this event, contact Marion Davis and the Human Rights Department at 336-373-2038. Rainy weather and short staffing resulted in the city extending the loose leaf collection program. The first round of collection will be completed on Saturday, January 14th. The second round of pickup will take place from Monday, January 16th through Friday, February 10th. A large number of leaves fell within the first few weeks last season, getting things off to a slow start. City crews have been working hard collecting more than 7,600 tons of leaves so far. That's 2,800 more tons than the amount collected this time last year. Stay in the know by checking the interactive map on the city's website to see where your neighborhood falls on the leaf collection route. Leaves are collected year-round. Simply put them in a clear plastic bag or a plastic or metal garbage can. Crews will collect the leaves on your regular trash collection day. The leaves are converted into compost and sells for $20 per truckload at the White Street Landfill. Please note, loose leaves on private streets are not collected. For more information, call the contact center at 336-373-2489. Cone Health has partnered with the city to share a series of brief and informative videos designed to inspire you to make better choices when it comes to healthy living. Following these tips is an easy way to help each of us improve our quality of life. Let's take a moment to check out today's news for your health. One in four Americans suffer from allergies. Don't let the things that contribute to your symptoms stop you from enjoying your activities. I am Dr. Rosalind Hicks, an allergist from Allergy and Asthma Center of North Carolina, a member of Cone Health Medical Group. Let's get started and talk about allergies. Allergies are the common cold. Very similar entities, they both consist of a lot of congestion, runny nose, sneezing, 
Typically with the common cold, you're gonna have starting out a little more scratchy throat, sore throat, and you often a little bit of fever. Both can have cough because of the postnasal drip, and you're gonna feel a little lousy with the common cold, will run down, uh, dehydrated, those kind of things. And then with allergies, it can be any time of year. Cold may be more common in the winter season, and allergies can be with exposure. Did you just mow the lawn? Did you just take care of the cat or dog? Did you just clean out the attic with lots of dust? So those are the things uh, we think about to differentiate between a common cold and allergies. The common triggers kind of fall into two categories, indoor, outdoor, seasonal, or year-round. So in the spring, we think a lot about tree pollen, we, followed by grass pollen and weed pollen. And then we have dust, mite, cockroach, mold, which can be indoors and out, and then any kind of furried animal, dog, cat, gerbil, any of those. So clearly if we're sensitive to the animals, then we shouldn't have animals, we shouldn't be exposed to them, but uh, we can't really control completely pollen exposure. So if you go outside, if you're doing something involving that exposure, then wearing a mask, if you have to mow the grass, wiping off your hands and feet, taking off your shoes before you walk through the house so you don't track the pollen through, minimizing the window being down as you ride down the road, and wiping off the cats and dogs when they come in from their walk so the pollen is not throughout the house and on the furniture, those kind of things. Well, of course avoidance would be the biggest action that we could participate in to try to minimize symptoms, but side of that, uh, adding medications to minimize the congestion, sneezing, runny nose, I'm a huge proponent of saline rinse, and so that's something easy that's not medicated, it's just salt water flushing out or clearing out the nasal passages so we can take away those allergens that we've been breathing in. And I think it is very important to prepare for allergy season so that you can minimize your suffering and you don't have so much congestion and headache or disrupted activity. I like to encourage people to start their medications around Valentine's Day, and usually that'll minimize their symptoms and they can go into the allergy season ahead and symptom free. It is important for individuals to think about allergy testing if they're having lots of symptoms, uncontrolled symptoms, they've tried multiple medications, or they feel like there's something, one specific thing that they're really interested in knowing that they're allergic to. And especially if you have upper and lower airway symptoms, if you're coughing and wheezing, then that has become quite the standard for management to, to consider allergy injections and we need to know exactly what you're allergic to to be able to put in your specific vial so that we can manage you with the injections if we uh, have the positive testing available there. And in the situation where you may be food allergic, having allergy testing can be very informative to know what to avoid. Thank you for joining us. I hope all this information has been helpful to decrease your suffering from allergies. For more information, go to conehealth.com wellness. I'm Dr. Roslyn Hicks. The City of Greensboro earns high marks for equality and future growth and development of the city is progressing according to plan. We'll have those stories and more news coming up after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to FYI Weekly. The Human Rights Campaign once again awards the City of Greensboro a perfect 100 points for its Municipal Equality Index, or MEI. This marks the second consecutive year the city received a perfect score. This ranks Greensboro first among all cities in North Carolina, tied with Chapel Hill and Carborough. The MEI examines the laws, policies, and services of municipalities and rates them on the basis of their inclusivity of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people who live and work in the city. Among the index categories where Greensboro scored highest were in municipal services, law enforcement, and the city's relationship with the LGBT community. The annual MEI is produced by the Human Rights Campaign, which represents more than 1.5 million members and supporters of the LGBT equality in the United States. Our neighboring cities of Winston-Salem and Durham earned a score of 92, while Raleigh and Charlotte scored 85 and 86, respectively. 
The complete MEI listing is available for review online. The Planning Department's second annual GSO 2040 Comprehensive Plan Implementation Report, which looks at citywide progress toward reaching growth goals, is currently available online. This annual report is a way to track GSO 2040's progress and evaluate broad land use trends. The report examines land use trends over the past fiscal year, which indicates strong activity at the edges of the city, particularly in East Greensboro. During the past 18 months, nearly 8,000 housing units were approved for development through rezoning and annexations. The report highlights projects that have been completed in the past year, such as the adoption of a downtown streetscape and upcoming projects for specific areas of the city, such as the Fleming Road Area Plan. You can follow the GSO 2040 implementation by signing up to receive an email when a new report is posted online. To subscribe, simply access the e-notify page on the city's website and select GSO 2040 in the news section. Dancer and choreographer Princess Johnson will be in residence at Greensboro Residency for Original Works from January 16th through March 12th. Johnson will develop choreography for a new ballet titled The Hair Journey. The ballet will tell the story of Zuri, a young girl who learns to love her hair just as it is. During the residency, Johnson will lead workshops focused on dance and hair care. All events are free to attend and registration is not required. Johnson is an international dancer, choreographer, entrepreneur, and motivator. She has been a choreographer since the tender age of eight. Johnson continued to pursue her passion and developed her dance technique training by completing a dance degree at University of North Carolina at Greensboro, along with her business degree and an internship with the Richmond Ballet in Richmond, Virginia. She taught classes at Triple Threat Dance Center in Winston-Salem and High Point, and then went on to establish Royal Expressions Contemporary Ballet in 2009. Johnson is also certified as a ballet teacher by the American Ballet Theater's National Training Curriculum. Grow is located next to the Davie Street entrance of the Greensboro Cultural Center, located at 200 North Davie Street. To learn more about the Grow Residency, visit the city's website. Older adults can feel out of their element when it comes to being computer savvy. Coming up after the break, we'll check in with a local nonprofit that bridges the technology gap for seniors. Stay with us. Welcome back to FYI Weekly. It goes without saying, we live in a high-tech world and you'll be left in the dust if you have low-tech skills, especially when it comes to computers. Joining me now to talk about the steps being taken to bridge the technology gap for seniors is Dr. W.A. Merritt. He is the Executive Director of OPEAT. Hello, Dr. Merritt. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining me. So tell us about organization to provide equal access to technology. Well, OPEAT, uh, Organization to Provide Equal Access to Technology, is actually 20 years old. It started in a time where uh, the digital divide was just starting in essence because a lot of people were coming out of textile mills and people who were released from incarceration uh, had a little to no knowledge of technology so that's where we got our beginnings 20 years ago. Oh that's impressive and to think that you're still going and knowing that it's relevant is really important. You do a focus of a program called Silver Tech. Tell us about that and how did that come about? Well Silver Tech came about because of COVID and the pandemic and the quarantine, uh, when people were quarantined in their, in their homes, and the only access they had was either through a telephone or through the internet. And I am a COVID survivor. I spent six weeks in the hospital, four weeks on the ventilator. And when I came out, uh, my first uh, visit with my doctor was through a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself when I took on this position as executive director with this technology nonprofit, how many seniors right now are suffering from the lack of the ability to have first a computer to know how to use it and then have access to the internet? So Silvertech was born out of that need. Well, we are so glad you survived COVID. Thank you. 
and thought of other seniors and how this could be advantageous for them. So speaking of which, what are the advantages of Silver Tech? Well, in essence, uh, we're partnered with uh, the Greensboro Parks and Recreation Department and have been for over a year. And uh, they have two senior facilities where seniors come in and they exercise and do other classes. So our partnership has been very valuable to the seniors because they're already coming to these locations. And so what we do is we teach them computer 101. That means how to turn one on. A lot of things that we take for granted as uh, just the average citizen who uses computers every day, some of our folks have never ever turned a computer on. Wow. So we teach them the basics as I've said before. Mm -hmm. And so when they complete the course, which is a four week course, they then get a computer to take home. Okay. And then we support them through technical and other support mechanisms so that they can continue to benefit from the course that they completed. And how often are the courses held? The, the courses uh, are once a week, two hours a day, uh, one day either a Thursday or Saturday presently. And uh, they go from 10 to 12. And then on the fifth week, they have graduation. And it's a major event. It's like graduating from college. Oh, wow. The participants dress up. We had one participant who was 93 years old. Oh, and her daughter also took the class. She was 71. <laughs> so you can imagine yeah. what these young people who are in their senior yes, years yes. are experiencing. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, how do you secure successful outcomes of the program moving forward? Well, one of the main things is when the program was designed, it was hopefully that it would be made available to anyone who met that criteria of a certain age and need. Unfortunately, until we get the resources necessary, we are having to pass along a cost. Mm -hmm. And that to some folks who are on a fixed income, mm -hmm. no matter how small it may be, can be uh, a, a, a very much a challenge to actually be able to, to pay for the course. And, and we incur the cost of, uh, of getting the computers, the instructor, and so we make it as complete as possible. And so we have to pass along a small cost to the uh, participants. So donations would be welcome. Donation, um, those who are, have <laughs> foundations and other funding sources, we would greatly appreciate an opportunity to apply. I, for our best of our knowledge, from our research, we're the only organization in the county of Guilford in the city of Greensboro that's providing technology training exclusively to seniors from the beginning to the end, as well as providing them with a computer to okay, take on. Okay, well, hopefully some ears are perking up out there and they will be sending you some checks. <laughs> Meantime, if there are seniors who are watching and they say, this is right up my alley, I need some computer skills and I need to get up on my technology, how can they connect with you and enroll in Silver Tech? Well, they can reach out to us in a number of ways. Uh, um, most first and foremost, if you're uh, going to the uh, senior citizen centers at, uh, in, in the city of Greensboro. Um, Trotter is one of our main uh, facilities and that's in the Hester Park uh, community in that area, uh, the senior citizen center. That's where we conduct most of our classes. And so they can walk in and sign up there. They can call us uh, at a, a phone number, the area code 202. 322-2604. And of course, you can also email us or go on our website and register as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Merritt, for all you're doing to keep our seniors competitive in this computer age. We do hope that you'll come back and give us updates on other programs and offerings that you have for our community. Thank you for having us and thank you for allowing us to get this information out to those who need it. Absolutely. Stay tuned for some interesting and useful information about Greensboro as we tell you something about the city. That's coming up after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to FYI Weekly. One way to stay informed about decisions that impact you and our city is by attending or tuning in to city council meetings at 5.30 p.m. on the first and third Tuesday of the month. The fourth Tuesday is reserved for a meeting as needed. 
The City Council has resumed meeting in the Katy Dorset Council Chamber on Level 2 of the Melvin Municipal Office Building, located at 300 West Washington Street. The public is allowed in person, but only in a limited capacity. Those who choose not to be in the building can participate virtually. The Greensboro City Council meetings are broadcast right here on GTN. The meetings are also streamed live on the City's website and on Roku. To review the council meeting schedule and agendas, please visit the city's website. Here's an opportunity to learn a little something about the city. The Trash and Recycling Container Compliance Program allows the city to issue a $25 fee when households repeatedly leave trash or recycling containers in the street, creating a nuisance to the neighborhood. In order to avoid a fee, be sure trash and recycling containers are at the curb no more than 48 hours from 7 a.m. the day before service to 7 a.m. the day after your service day. This 48-hour window is twice as long as the previous policy, giving more flexibility. The program is complaint-driven. City staff will issue a warning for the first violation and a courtesy removal of containers out of the right-of-way. Afterwards, each occurrence will be charged $25 if city staff has to remove containers from the curb. This will be a rolling 12-month fee. If no violations take place within one year of the previous fee, a new warning will be issued for the next violation. Submit complaints to the City's Contact Center at 336-373-CITY. For more information, visit the City's website. Coming up after the break, we'll showcase our department spotlight, but first, prepare to mark your calendars for places to go and things to do on the town. There's a little bit of everything in this week's listing of events on the town. Comedian George Lopez brings his OMG High tour to the Tanger Center in downtown Greensboro on Friday, January 13th. The Grammy-nominated Funny Man starred in the TV sitcom bearing his name for six seasons and remains a popular entertainer. Tickets start at $45.50. Learn more at TangerCenter.com. Join Dance Project for its Open House Week. From January 9th through the 14th, youth students are invited to try out unlimited classes for free. There's a range of contemporary dance classes for all ages and abilities. See Dance Project's full spring schedule and sign up for the free classes at danceproject.org. The world's most action-packed motorsports experience for families returns to Greensboro for an adrenaline-charged weekend that fans can only see on January 14th and 15th. Celebrating its 30th anniversary this year, Monster Jam features world-class athletes in intense competitions of speed and skill. Tickets cost $20 and up and are available online at GreensboroColiseum.com. If you're hoping for a snowy winter and the weather doesn't cooperate, head over to the Hemp Hill Library on January 14th for a blizzard of snowy science. School-aged children will make insta-snow, a snowstorm in a jar, and more. Learn more about this free program on the city's website at greensboro-nc.gov. And youth are invited to honor the memory of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the MLK Day of Service on January 15th at the Simpkins Indoor Sports Pavilion at Barber Park. Volunteers will pack snack packs and first aid kits and also make no-sew blankets for those in need. Register for this free event online at volunteercentertriad.org. Stay tuned to FYI Weekly for more happenings on the town. Welcome back. The City of Greensboro has more than 20 departments and several divisions committed to serving you, our residents and visitors. Let's go behind the scenes in our department spotlight. The Housing and Neighborhood Development Department received City Council approval to establish a home repair GSO program. This addresses the home repair needs of low-income homeowners. To be eligible, households must fall below 60% of the area's median income, and the homeowners must have owned the property for at least five years and lived there as their primary residence. Properties must be located within the Greensboro city limits. The housing bond and community development block grants have been allocated for this program. 
The City Council also approved a resolution to approve up to a $5 million investment in the Greensboro Preservation Loan Fund for the production and preservation of affordable housing through a public-private lending partnership. The Community Foundation of Greater Greensboro has worked with lending institutions, foundations, and investors to raise more than $20 million in private capital towards the Greensboro Housing Fund. In total, they plan to raise $32.5 million. This is expected to yield more than 900 improved affordable units in the next 10 to 15 years. The $5 million is available through the 2022 Housing Bond Funds approved by voters. Straight ahead on the other side of the break is this week's Way to Go GSO shout out. Stay with us. As we draw to a close, we always want to end on a positive note with our Way to Go GSO shout out. This week's shout out goes to Greensboro City Lakes. The annual Big Bass Battle is a 12 month competition to catch the largest bass at Brant, Higgins or Townsend Lakes. Registration is open at any of the city lakes for a one-time entry fee of $25. The person who catches the largest bass each month receives a Big Bass Battle t-shirt, an annual pass for all three lakes valued at $120, plus entry into the 2024 Championship Fish Off. The person who catches the largest bass at the championship will receive a $1,000 prize. This contest is sponsored by Fisherman's Cove, Bait, Tackle, and more. For more information about the City Lakes, visit the City's website. That concludes this edition of FYI Weekly, but you can easily stay connected to the latest City news by linking to us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Alexa users can subscribe to our 5-Minute Flash Briefings, which airs on 90.1 FM and 100.7 FM. Be sure to download both weekly podcasts, Talk City Greensboro and Connect GSO, plus GTN is streaming on Roku. For all of us here at the City of Greensboro, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.